Meep. Stranger Things. I have opinions about it. I think it's safe to say at this point that Stranger Things has officially cemented itself as a staple of pop culture, on the same level as things like Star Wars, Marvel, or even the highly coveted Billy Owens franchise. Good morning, children. There are many comparisons you could make between Stranger Things and other giant tentpole franchises. But I think the real proof that Stranger Things has hit the big time is that when you make a video about Stranger Things, you are legally obligated to give the disclaimer that you are a fan of the series. That being said, I am a fan of the series. However, I'm probably the most casual fan imaginable. Like, I've been there since day one, which was over seven years ago already, somehow, and since then, I've been there at each new season's release, and I enjoyed them all about as much as the rest of the fandom. But unlike the rest of the fandom, I have never felt compelled to re-watch even a single episode of the show. Or at least, not until recently. The writer's strikes in Hollywood may thankfully be over, and hopefully SAG-AFTRA will get a fair deal soon, but the fifth and final season of Stranger Things is still a long way from completion. So I figured there would never be a better time than this strange hiatus to re-watch all four seasons and give my thoughts on each one. So I'm going to do just that, but before I do, I have to give some huge warnings. One, I will obviously be massively spoiling the entire series. Two, I want to give a very clear photosensitivity warning because Stranger Things has a ton of flashing lights in it. And lastly, there will be light discussions of abuse, trauma, and self-harm in this video. So if engaging with those topics puts you at risk of harm, please click away now. Otherwise, stick around as I start by talking about the second best season of Stranger Things. Believe it or not, season one of Stranger Things was the season I was most scared to revisit. When it first released, there was a bit of novelty to Stranger Things being a nostalgic ode to the 80s, but now the novelty of nostalgia culture hasn't just worn off for me, it's been completely blown into oblivion. So I was really anxious that this season would lose most of its charm upon a rewatch, but I'm happy to tell you that it didn't. In fact, I think it's still pretty good. The conversation surrounding Stranger Things understandably centers around the fact that it's a pastiche work. It owes everything to Stephen King and Steven Spielberg. But I think the show still has a ton of merit outside of that. The directing in season one is so confident, featuring a lot of thoughtful, dynamic, eye-catching shots and sequences. It is so obvious that the Duffer Brothers had much of the show visually mapped out in their heads, and it's no small feat that they were able to execute their vision with such clarity. The show is also tightly edited. Every molecule of fat has been trimmed from this first season. Every cut feels like it was made with frame-perfect precision, leaving every episode exactly as long as it needed to be, and not a second more. Not to mention how well-performed the series is. Like, I, I know the actors already get a ton of credit, but I don't think that's undeserved at all. I don't think there's a better way to prove how much the performances carry this season than by illustrating that the entire plot hinges on Will Byers being found, Will Byers being the character with the least screen time of any major character in this season. We only really get to know him for like five minutes in the opening episode, so the only tangible reason we really have to continue caring about Will Byers is that the other characters care about him. Winona Ryder as Joyce especially kills it in this regard. I know there are probably people out there who think Joyce is a bit over the top in this season, but believe me when I tell you that this is a devastatingly accurate portrayal of a grieving mother. If Joyce and Jonathan weren't so convincingly distraught over Will's disappearance, and if Mike, Lucas, Dustin, and Hopper weren't so convincingly determined to find him, the whole show would fall apart instantly. But miraculously, every performance here is convincing and keeps the foundational goal of the show, that being finding Will, both 
urgent and emotionally captivating. Having said all that though, obviously everything I just spoke about is in service of a nostalgic ode. Despite all of its technical merit and the wonderful performances, the show can never escape the fact that it is a blatant Spielberg and King homage, with a dash of John Carpenter and Wes Craven, among others, for good measure. The thing is, though, I feel like it's often forgotten that faithfully and effectively emulating Spielberg and King, two of the most successful people to ever touch their craft, is a tall order. It seems simple to just combine E.T. and It. So simple that anyone could have done it, but in reality, it may be simple, but it is not easy. Even Spielberg himself couldn't properly emulate his own style with Ready Player One, at least not in my book. Nothing about the way that Stranger Things is executed, even when it comes to its story, is lazy. Clever setups and payoffs, trickling of information, character development, engaging dialogue. All of this is Screenwriting 101. It is all simple, but I'll say it again, none of it is easy, and Stranger Things Season 1 does it all to great effect. It manages to emulate not just the visual cues of its influences, but also their tone, structure, and most importantly, their emotional impact. Every individual element I've talked about combines and creates a season of television that still really makes me care. Not just because I'm a huge Spielberg fan and E.T. is my favorite film, not just because I was born and raised in small town Indiana and the show brings back my feelings of growing up there, but because the show is just so damn heartfelt and honest. The characters feel like people, the story is so intrinsically human and relatable, and the show manages to capture both the comforts and the horrors of life with a ton of earnesty. It never holds back, whether it's giving you a warm embrace or punching you in the gut, which is a rare sight in today's world of very placating general audience entertainment. Stranger Things Season 1 doesn't just lazily bring back the iconography of the 80s, it brings back why we remembered any of that iconography in the first place. The way it made us feel. Feel. But even so, I do think that this season can still feel contrived at times, and obviously all art is contrived by definition. I, I just mean that I felt the thought process behind some of the choices this season made were a little too transparent at times. Well, the kids are already riding their bikes away from scary guys driving vans, so we have to have a moment where Eleven uses her powers to help them escape because that's what happened in E.T. More importantly than any obvious references, though, I feel the transparency in the show's decision-making works to the detriment of major characters like Jonathan Byers and Steve Harrington. Their actions feel a little too calculated at times, like Jonathan has to take inappropriate photos of Nancy at a party, so that way later we can have the obvious reveal that he actually took a photograph of the creature even though that makes Jonathan look like a really creepy dude. And then Steve has to get angry at Jonathan for taking those photos and destroy Jonathan's camera so that Nancy can see the photographs and put two and two together, yada yada yada, obvious monster reveal, even though that makes Steve look like a total asshole. And it's not that I don't like the moral complexity at play here, I don't think either of these guys need to necessarily be good people to be good characters. Characters having dimension is an essential aspect of character writing, duh. But my issue is that the moral switch-ups feel entirely too abrupt. Jonathan and Steve both flip like a light switch between being altruistic and being problematic when it's convenient for the plot, leaving their character arcs feeling very jagged. Oh, what a nice guy. Just kidding, he's a total dick. <laughs> nah, but for real though, he's a good dude. This could reasonably be chalked up to these characters being teenagers, but they also exist in a world where three 12-year-old boys mostly talk and think like fully grown adults. All this to say, the Steve and Jonathan love triangle was really the only element that fell flat for me upon this rewatch. But for the sake of full transparency, love triangles rarely do anything for me in general, so this could all easily just be a me thing. But now comes the single most important question every Stranger Things fan has to ask themselves at some point. Should Stranger Things have ended at season one? My answer is no. I do think that season one would have fully worked as a standalone miniseries. Sure, there are many loose threads that even the show itself acknowledges. The campaign 
was way too short. Yeah. It was 10 hours. But it doesn't make any sense. It makes sense. Oh, uh, no. What about the lost night? And the proud princess and those weird flowers in the cave? I don't know. But personally, none of that stuff ever really mattered to me. Stranger Things season one, still to this day, is fully satisfying in and of itself. I never needed anything more. But now that I have the context of all the other seasons, I'm overall glad that I did get more, and I wouldn't give it all up to live in a world where Stranger Things was just a beloved, self-contained miniseries. However, had you asked me should Stranger Things have ended at Season 1 back when Season 2 originally released, I would have given you an entirely different answer. Season 2 was the one I was most excited to revisit because I was bitterly disappointed by it when it released. That sounds contradictory, because it is. A part of me was secretly hoping that re-watching this season would give me a newfound appreciation for it, and now that I've re-watched it, I can confidently say that Season 2 is far better than I ever gave it credit for. It's still easily my least favorite season, but hey, it's better than I thought it was. Plot-wise, Season 2 is far more interested in wrapping up loose ends from Season 1 than it is in progressing the series forward in any meaningful way. What about that thing that Will puked up into the sink at the end of Season 1? Why was he still seeing visions of the Upside Down? Well, here's your explanation. Where did Eleven go? Hopper left Egos in the forest, does that mean Elle's still alive? Well, here she is. Wait, so, so Nancy ended up with Steve? But what about all that tension between her and Jonathan? Well, here's more of that. What happened to numbers 1 through 10? Well, here's a clue. Justice for Barb? Here it is. Mike promised Eleven that they'd go to the snowball together, but they never did. Well, now they do. I know the way I delivered that sounds kind of condescending. <laughs> it's just that as a result of this, the plot of season 2 ultimately feels anticlimactic, and relies mostly on playing it by the book. Repeating a lot of the beats from the first season in service of giving fans most of the answers and moments they wanted to see, which is not inherently a bad thing, as there are some great moments here, like the really charming scenes of the party going trick-or-treating, or the downright horrific burning sequence with Will, or the really eerie and visually stunning Mind Flayer reveal. I also really enjoy the character of Bob. It's still really refreshing to see a portrayal of just an average guy who is a fundamentally good person. He's just very wholesome and endearing. What else can I say? But the most important thing this season does is to introduce Max and Billy, which ultimately pays off way more in future seasons, but there's still an important introduction nonetheless. I just don't think that any of this stuff adds up to make this season feel consequential overall. It feels more like an epilogue to season one than a true sequel. I will give it credit that it, at the very least, feels like it branched out a bit in terms of establishing its own identity, which was something that was clearly on the mind of the creative team while making this. I had a few issues. Issues? I just felt it was a little derivative in parts, but... What are you talking about? I just wish it had a little more originality, that's all. And don't get me wrong, a lot of the technical aspects are still as good as season one, including the editing and cinematography, and I still really enjoyed the directorial style of the show, especially the episodes helmed by the Duffer Brothers, but there's really only one major reason I can wholeheartedly recommend this season, and that is the characters. They don't just carry the season, they are the season. They're the only reason to watch it. Even more so than character development, I feel that Stranger Things excels at character interaction, and season two is a great example of that. The writers are just acutely aware of how to pair up the characters in interesting ways and make their personalities shine through even more. The Steve and Dustin pair up was a genius move, one that for many fans, myself included, completely redeems how erratic Steve was in Season 1. I also thought that Lucas and Max were a great pairing. They really brought a lot out of each other, and really made their characters feel much more well-defined as their relationship continued to bloom. But the highlight for me is Eleven and Hopper. I just thought that that worked so well, not only because they both sort of have baggage when it comes to each other's respective roles, like 
Eleven has a lot of baggage involving her father figure, and Hopper has a lot of baggage involving his daughter. But even just their personalities bouncing off each other felt like an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object in the best way possible. It's so entertaining to just watch these characters talk to each other that I'm completely willing to forgive a more plotting story, as it does give more breathing room for the characters to interact. And damn do the Duffer brothers know how to pull off an ending. The, the ending of season two hit me emotionally in a lot of ways I didn't expect, especially given that I wasn't really into the actual plot at all. But I can't say it enough, these characters just... The whole school dance sequence at the end just solidifies how good they are. But you can't talk about season two without addressing the elephant in the room. Episode seven. Easily the most infamous episode of the entire series. I will say that upon rewatch, I can see why this episode would make sense on paper. Eleven can't just be trapped in Hopper's cabin for the entire season. She has to have something to do, preferably something that tells you more about her backstory. But you can't have her get too involved with the central conflict of the story too early on. Otherwise, the plot will just resolve itself really quickly. So, so what do you do? Well, how about she visits her mother, which is a great idea, and I think that's executed pretty well in episode 5, and again, on paper, her finding out about a lost sister and then going out to find her in episode 7 is also a good idea, especially since her lost sister has mind powers and can prey upon Eleven's fears and force her to grow. It also helps that she's more experienced and can teach Eleven how to unleash her full power against larger threats, which will explain her sort of power gap at the end of the season. And all that being said, this side quest would, in theory, make for an excellent opportunity to make the show more distinct from its influences, to take a creative risk to show that Stranger Things can be more than derivative. So again, in concept, every single choice in this episode made sense to me, but in execution, it's like the episode was completely set up to fail. For one, the rest of the season plays it so safe that this episode's tonal departure immediately makes it stick out like a sore thumb. Two, this is the only episode of the entire season that doesn't intercut with other storylines, which feels even worse since it interrupts a major moment in the story that I was fully invested in by that point. Which wouldn't be so bad if the episode felt important and wholly necessary in order to tell this story, but lastly, three, you really only get two crucial pieces of information here. Papa might still be alive, and Eleven learns that anger makes her more powerful. That's it. Other than Eleven having to make the tough choice of giving up someone who truly understands her in order to save her friends back in Hawkins, there's really nothing in this episode you couldn't have squeezed into the scenes with her mom. And none of the information this episode gives you is truly followed up on until season four, so even in context, this episode is just sort of baffling. Still though, overall, sometimes despite itself, season two manages to be a fun and mostly breezy watch. I just wish I could recommend it more for holistic reasons rather than just recommending it for individual elements. It just doesn't come together the way the first season does, and often I'd be more quick to recommend season two as just something to put on around Halloween or something to watch out of obligation in order to understand seasons three and four than I would be to recommend it on its own merit. I don't think it's a travesty. I don't think that it should be deleted from existence. It's just fine. And I'll probably never really see it as anything more than that. But I'm glad I was able to find at least some new appreciation for it in retrospect, which is more than I can say about season three. Honestly, I don't have a lot to say about season three. It was fun. I had fun watching it. That's really all you need to know. I'm just kidding, I'll talk about it a little bit. When season three first released, I was super ecstatic about it. I thought it felt like a return to form, and in a lot of ways, it is. Much like season one, I think season three displays just how far a lot of bread and butter filmmaking techniques can get you 
when executed effectively. It's well-directed, tightly edited, excellently written and performed, all that jazz. It retains all of those things from those first two seasons. But it does manage to pull off a greater sense of scope than those first two seasons did, paving the way for the more epic saga-like approach of season four something that the final season is apparently only going to double down on. I guess I just wish that the season was a bit more ambitious? Most of the changes feel confined to the aesthetic of the show, trading in the more gloomy autumn atmosphere of the first two seasons for a radiant day, neon-soaked night, summertime setting. Which does manage to do a lot to help the season stand out, despite the familiarities of the script. I also appreciated just how much more gory and horrific this season was. Like, I don't even care that it's a big CGI abomination. I personally love the human meat mind flayer. All the scenes of people melding into the monster, whether it be getting their soul sucked out through a tentacle or exploding into a pile of goo, all of it was just really effectively shocking on a visceral level. But these changes weren't really enough to get me fully on board with this season's plot, at least not on a rewatch. Keep in mind though, this was an entirely different viewing experience for me. When I first watched this season, I waited roughly two years to see it. I was bitterly disappointed by season two, and initially felt like I was watching season three out of obligation more than anything, so when season three managed to be a fun summertime adventure that harkened back to a lot of what I enjoyed about that first season, I honestly loved it so much that I thought, at the time, that it was the best season of the show. But this time, I watched each season back to back in one elongated binge. So by the time I got to season three, I was a little exhausted by the Stranger Things formula. I wasn't very invested at all in the literal stakes of the story. The fate of Hawkins never felt like it was in any real jeopardy to me, mainly because it was finally dawning on me just how formulaic the mystery was and how intangible the threats were. Despite the cool design of the meat flayer, or whatever you want to call it, uh, the villain's goals felt as nebulous as ever. A simple monster and a team of scientists worked well for the first season because it was overall a much more simple and grounded story. In season two, the vague eugenicist angle of the Mind Flayer, as well as it being interlinked with Will, was enough to give the season a semblance of stakes. But by season three, I feel like they just exhausted about all you could do with the monster and scientist's concept. The intentions felt shallow, the tactics were repetitive, and as a result, the stakes felt non-existent to me. Or at least they would have if I didn't like these characters so damn much. Much like season two, the strength lies in character dynamics. Max and Eleven forming a friendship and going shopping together is so heartwarming and interjects a lot of needed female perspective into the show. Personally, I empathize so much with Will's inability to cope with change and losing his connection with his childhood friends. Again, a good example of how Stranger Things is very honestly heartbreaking at times. And I could listen to Dustin, Steve, Robin, and Erica talk about a stale bagel for an hour, and I'd probably be riveted. And ultimately, that is what I'm here for, right? Like, I should care about defeating the Mind Flayer because I don't want to see any of these characters die. Or do I? If there's one thing above all else that the Stranger Things team gets a lot of flack for, it's constantly dangling major character deaths in front of our faces without ever having an intention of following through. They really only seem interested in killing off characters that you either were just introduced to, or ones you just really started to get to know. And again, my feelings pretty closely align with everyone else's here. I'm not a big fan of this trope. Hopper's death at the end of season three was one of the most pivotal and consequential moments of the entire series. It was a huge reason why I enjoyed this season as much as I did when it first released, just for it to be completely undercut immediately in the following season. Which I think is a pretty good encapsulation of what season three lacks above all else, which is high stakes to match its grand scope and spectacle. It's hard for me to feel that any major characters are threatened by this evil force when all of them seem invincible. And yet, as they always seem to do, the Duffers once again knocked it out of the park with season three's ending. They must have been really paying attention at the Robert McKee storytelling Lecture. Wow them in the end, you got a hit. You can have flaws, problems, but wow them in the end, and you've got a hit. Even on a rewatch, I got so swept up in Eleven reading the speech from Hopper 
that all of my complaints magically evaporated, even if it was just for that brief moment. Unlike season two, despite my laundry list of complaints that I spent too long discussing in this segment of the video, I feel like season three's ending does truly culminate into something greater than the sum of its parts. It feels consequential if for no other reason that, even in retrospect, it still does feel like the show found its footing again, which is only more satisfying knowing the giant step forward that season four took from there. Season four of Stranger Things is easily the best season of the entire show and it's not even close. While it doesn't work in a vacuum like the first season does, I think it's precisely for that reason that season four is so masterful. More so than any other, this season builds on the foundation of all that came before it. Season four has much more dynamic storytelling, juggling more characters and plot lines. It's also more explosive and much grander in scale, leaving the most consequential impacts on the town of Hawkins that we've ever seen. And it's also a much more self-indulgent season, being nearly twice as long as any other. But I ultimately mean that as a full compliment. While I did find myself occasionally yearning for the more precise editing and brisk pacing of that first season, I still believe the extended runtime of season four allows the audience to become fully encompassed in every moment, which makes each moment feel more impactful. But more importantly to me than any of that, I think this season brings everything full circle in an incredibly satisfying way, mostly through the newly introduced villain Vecna, who does finally deliver a villain who has clear intentions and motivation, but that's not the reason why his inclusion is so gratifying to me. When rewatching all the seasons back to back, I expected to find Vecna's trail scattered throughout in various clues, and there are certainly hints here and there of Vecna's existence, but honestly, all of those hints pale in comparison to the more important setup the show was doing on a thematic level. Grief and trauma have been an integral part of Stranger Things from the jump. Whether it be Joyce and Hopper processing their grief over their lost children in season one, or displaying Will Byers' trauma from his exposure to the Upside Down in season two, as well as Max and Billy's abusive relationship, which in and of itself was a product of cyclical abuse, to everyone ruminating on Hopper's death and witnessing Billy's death in season three, or Eleven attempting to grapple with the trauma inflicted on her by Papa at Hawkins' lab in every season. But I think season four, more than any other, doubles down on all of that. Every character in this season is grieving or traumatized in one way or another, but never is that more obvious than it is with Max, who is clearly struggling internally with a lot of conflicting feelings surrounding her brother's death. When it comes to realistic depictions of grief in Stranger Things, Max is on the opposite end of the spectrum compared to Joyce in season one. Her grief is a lot more understated and, in a lot of ways, more poignant as a result. We see her closing herself off from those who care, becoming cold and distant. We see her unwillingness to be vulnerable, and eventually we get the catharsis of seeing her finally admit that maybe she wanted Billy to die, and that's just so raw and brutally honest. The show never shies away from the subject matter, even going so far as to make a very direct metaphor for intent to self-harm by showing Max writing notes for her friends to read after she's gone. Which of course means I have to mention the running up that hill sequence, which has been talked about to death since it took the world by storm, but the Kate Bush lyrics combined with the powerful allegory of how being surrounded by people who care and having art that speaks to your experiences can help pull you through depression. I'm sorry, there's just not a more life-affirming scene in all of Stranger Things. It shouldn't surprise anyone that this resonated so deeply with people. And I don't think enough can be said for how thoughtful and challenging this portrayal of Max is, especially within a piece of mass-marketed entertainment. And all of that, as I said, is tied together by Vecna, who specifically chooses his targets because of the trauma they've experienced, forcing them to relive their worst moments 
in believing himself to be mercifully ending their suffering. Vecna's presence forces each character to confront themselves on the innermost level, and brings a ton of emotional baggage to the surface. Again, as I mentioned earlier, almost every major character in Season 4 is struggling with some form of grief, trauma, or repression, and a lot of them have been doing that since the very beginning of the show. Which retroactively gives the entire series a sense of thematic cohesion that it never had before. And that is the essence of why Season 4 is so satisfying to me. Why it is leagues above its predecessors. Thematic cohesion is something that, to me, only the best pieces of media can manage to achieve. And another thing that is so refreshing about this is that Season 4's greatness doesn't really ruin any of the other seasons for me. In fact, I often find it to do quite the opposite. Even though I spent a ton of time complaining about various choices the show made, especially in the Season 2 and 3 portions of this video, much like this show always manages to do, it paid off everything so effectively by the end of Season 4 that I'm willing to forgive all of my gripes. It all was building to this, and I don't even mean that in a the Duffers had it all planned out from the beginning type of way, I mean it more so as everything those first three seasons did, including stumbling around a bit trying to find their footing, is what allowed Stranger Things to finally find solid ground to call its own in Season 4. I could talk about this season forever, honestly. I, I really, really love it and I could pick it apart over and over and over again. This entire video could have been me just fawning over every choice that Season 4 made, but I'm trying to keep it brief here, and I'd rather, at the moment, talk about now. You know? Like, the fifth and final season, it's on the way. It's a ways off, but it, it's on the way. And it promises to be even larger than Season 4. The ending of all endings. It has the insurmountable task of definitively wrapping up this entire journey. And I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little scared of being disappointed, because I don't know how you'd even begin to craft a satisfactory conclusion to a story this broad. But I do know now, having rewatched all of it, that if anyone can do it, it's the Duffer Brothers and the rest of the wonderful creative team behind Stranger Things. So I'm abundantly happy that it seems that that team will now be more fairly compensated for their hard work, and I will absolutely be there when the final season is ready. Thank you so much to everybody who donates to my Patreon, like these lovely people on screen, as well as everyone who supports me by liking the video, or subscribing, or doing any of that other YouTube bullshit. And lastly, just thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna go sit on my couch and completely dissociate. Bye!